Hello, Guardians. Welcome back to Tower Casuals, the Destiny podcast. I am one of your hosts, Corey Deering, and alongside me, as always, is none other than the Jotun Toten, the vault dwelling, the mayor of the Deepstone Crypt, the disciple himself, my favorite co host on the Citadel, Josh Finney. Excellent. Josh, I feel like we haven't podcasted in like a while. Like, three yeah, weeks. it's. <laughs> Man, I was trying to do the math earlier on what it was. It, it's been three weeks. It feels longer because a lot's happened in those three weeks. Right. Uh, you you traveled for business. I've literally gone out of the country and back. Um, it's it's been a good couple of weeks. It's just uh, for some reason uh, it wasn't the summer that was busy this year. It was spring. Yeah. Um, I've got another couple of big things coming up this week. Uh, my cousin got a job across the state, so I'm helping her move on Saturday. And then one of my best friends is moving to Australia on Monday morning. So uh, we've got a going away party for her and her husband on uh, Sunday afternoon. Australia? What for? Australia. Oi, they're going down under. Down um, under. He has a job with a startup that is affiliated with a university in Sydney. Ah. Oh, okay. That is like something having to do with like AI. Oh. So, yeah, when the robots inevitably take over the world, um, her husband is to blame. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that since, you know, he's he's part of a company that's working on AIs, when they take over, maybe they'll be benevolent towards me because I was a friend of the founders, and uh, I say please and thank you when I talk to Siri. So <laughs> that, that's, that's all I can hope for. That'll do it. That'll I do also, it. That's why I don't use... Uh, so I don't use my uh, personal assistance. Yeah. But we're not here to talk about my fear of AI, That's my true. fear of the future, the inevitability of it all. That's true. You know what we're here for, Josh? Destiny. To be casuals. Yes. Sitting in a tower. Yeah. Yeah. Drinking Ooh. water this time. I started a, uh, started a healthy eating regimen. So we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, I've been attempting that, too. Uh, I had my first soda of the week today. And, uh, man, let me tell you, uh, I went cold turkey from having uh, caffeine every day to having no caffeine, like not even coffee. And holy shit. Yeah. Uh, man, I, I anybody who's watched us for any length of time or has known me for any length of time knows that... Uh, I, I don't I don't drink a ton of sodas, but I do drink a lot of Red Bull um, and uh, and things like that. So just cutting out all types of caffeine altogether, like even natural caffeine, like in coffee, uh, has been a really rude awakening. The purple bags under my eyes that have been fixtures for years have gotten worse. <laughs> Man, if I look any worse and I cut my hair, I'd probably end up looking like... Uh, Dollar General Master Chief in the Halo TV series. Oh boy, oh boy, indeed. Uh, I have not. Uh, I haven't had the courage to watch it yet. Uh, our friend uh, Joe asks every couple days if I've watched it yet. I'm like, no, I I can't do it. I'm I'm waiting until episode four hits next week, and then I'll binge like three or four episodes all at once. Yeah, uh, I, I've been too deep into Moon Knight to care. Yeah, I figured. Like, uh, on the on the side of things that are actually good, <laughs> and that I have no reason to dread anymore, uh, Moon Knight's great. Yeah, it's, I hear I hear Moon Knight is uh, pretty good. I watched the first episode. I have not watched the second. The I think the second is uh, it definitely feels more MCU in the second. I think in terms of like the humor and some of the action, but uh, it's also like kind of perfectly in line with his comics from like the last ten to fifteen years. Like just the, the absurdity of it all, um, the absurdity, split personality, things like that. It's it's good. It's good. I, anybody who wants something fresh from the MCU, this is this is your thing. Cool. But uh, before we jump into the twop, there there is a reason that I'm bringing up TV shows. There is fresh speculation fresh. Uh, over at Bungie about. An animated series. I, I bring this up. I bring up fresh speculation because, as you guys know, I, I've been beating the drum for for quite some time now that I, I want a Destiny anime, and I feel like we're getting close because the uh, creator and director of Arcane over at Netflix has actually officially joined Bungie. 
Ooh. Uh, joined a few months ago. Uh, we knew this right around the time that the news of the uh, the Sony acquisition happened. Uh, but I, w- I want to get this exact listing pulled up because I saw a lot of people talking about it uh, yesterday and today or uh, this morning and this afternoon. And I want to see. I, I got I got to scroll through and find it and see where it is. But. If they really are hiring, I, I wanted to read this in real time. All of us take a look at it because uh, I want to know exactly what we're looking at here. Um, of course, now I can't find it. Now that I want to find it. And I peeped it earlier. Un momento, por favor. One moment, he says. We need like <laughs> we need some great like on hold music. <laughs> where's uh, where's that tower music? Where's the uh? Oh my god! Yeah, get get me get me the D one tower music. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, uh, oh god damn it! That's not what I wanted. Josh, you said you were ready. <laughs> I I was ready, and for whatever reason, my tabs did not load for this specific. Uh, instance God, come on open jesus christ <laughs> Fuck. Go josh ahead. i have good news while you're looking for that though yes give me good give me good news while i'm still looking guess 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 who's va- disney vacation is booked for november oh my god guess who might be there in november who you me. really yeah really oh uh, so we were we we're kind of making a uh, a last minute decision to go this fall with uh, another couple uh, that we're friends with, and we were going to try to go in October. But people keep deciding to get married and have celebrations of holy matrimony. Mm. So uh, it's making it really hard for me to be able to book a vacation. Apparently, so we're we're getting we're inching closer and closer to going in November at this point. Ooh, Josh here. You have, Here we go. I finally found it. You yes. You need to go the same time that I do this time. You know what? If maybe if the Earl had decided to keep the Hawaiian barbecue sub, I would. There's there's other subs there. They're, We're just gonna it's, you're it's just gonna look the at them as second rate subs now. That's all. Uh, I definitely had that feeling. I I had the uh, I had the Earl's club, and I was not as happy with it. Mm. Here we go. All right. Senior producer of Linear Media. Uh, You'll produce projects that extend the franchise into new category, including TV, film, books, comics, and audio format. As a senior producer, you'll work with creative leadership and external partners to ensure linear media projects are hitting milestones, staying on budget, and representing destiny at the highest quality bar. So this is kind of one of the first actual we're hiring for outside of game development that we've seen at Bungie for expanding the universe uh we know they're hiring a marketing and franchise director for whatever the next project they release is whether that's matter whether that's the third person action adventure game we've heard about maybe the mobile game is still kicking we don't actually know um whatever it is they're working on next they're hiring for that but they're also expanding this universe we know that was a pretty big reason why they want to go with sony and why sony wanted them as well with sony making the foray into film and tv including you know we had Ratchet and Clank a few years ago, kind of as a test run. You had Uncharted. We've, of course, got The Last of Us coming later this year. And the uh, director of uh, John Wick is going to tackle Ghost of Tsushima next year. Um, next year or the year after. I don't know when that's slated to release, question mark. But Destiny is pretty clearly going to be a pillar of Sony's ambitions to be moving into other types of media. Um, we talked at the time about how Sony has a relationship with Dark Horse Comics. And I think this is a great opportunity to get Destiny Comics back out there. I mean, see what form a book would take from Destiny? I don't know that I'd want like a traditional prose novel. You mean like a like a like a Halo type novel for Destiny? Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't hmm. I don't know how I would feel about that considering like just how the lore for this series is written out. Yeah. Um but I, I like I, I think that it's better suited for a TV series or like, I love that they specifically talk about audio here because if there's one thing I think that Halo has done over the last several years that I'm shocked 
that Bungie has not done with Destiny. It's audio logs. Mm -hmm. Not just the ones you find in-game, but um, the Hunt the Truth for Halo 5 was still one of my favorite marketing campaigns, I think. Right, and they did they did a couple for Halo Infinite also, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Yeah, they did some they did some for Halo Infinite to talk about some of the new gadgets, some of the new gear, like the history behind it all, um, history mm. of the chief. And I really like all that. I really, really, really would like for Bungie to do that. I could see them getting like Lance Reddick in on this. Yeah. Um, you know, hey, call call Lance up. He'll he'll do a day of recording in the closet for this. What's he doing? He's still playing Destiny on a base PS4. Come on. Yeah, first off, let's get my man a PS5. Uh, second off, like, come on, man. You, you're you going to have that... So- we are still waiting for the Sony deal to officially go through. I should I should note that. We are still waiting. I suspect that once we have the confirmation that's officially gone through, they're going to kick production of this into overdrive. Like, yeah. hey, you're sharing some of your engineers with our teams to learn how to make live service games. We'll share some of our people from, like, the film and TV and audio side to help you instigate your own projects over there. Right. Uh, and th- this is the clearest step. So you have the person who's actually going to be the complete director over like film, TV, and audio adaptations uh, from Arcane, and then presumably that person is going to bring some of their own people. I would be shocked if they didn't. But you've clearly got a senior producer here. I would be, even though this is a publicly listed position, unless it's somebody who's just like insanely qualified, I'd be really surprised if this didn't come from within the story group at the studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like that's, that's gotta be a thing because they, they say here, um, intimate knowledge of the entire creative life cycle from developing ideas, uh, at earliest inception to final release to audiences, um, love of storytelling across multiple media categories and franchise building. Um, and then, uh, experience adapting and extending IP to new mediums. Uh, you, you got to think that, you know, and one of the things you'll be doing is, you know, uh, support, uh, but get support and get Bungie approval on pitches, stories, outline scripts, draft storyboards, anima- uh, animations, cuts, etc. cetera. Um, this is when we talked last year about the next evolution of the IP, with the promotion of Luke and Mark to kind of being the franchise directors and not just the day-to-day game guys. Uh, that's the role that Joe Blackburn and Justin Truman have stepped into. Um, as we were talking about with the Axios interview last week in the GDC talk, it's clear they, they have a whole path forward. Like They plan on being in this position for quite a while. And with Luke and Mark, we've I think it's kind of fair for us to wonder, like, what the hell have you guys been doing? And I think it's cooking up ideas for the expansion of the IP pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. Um, There is no way that they were not involved at the highest levels of the talks for the sale to Sony. Right. Uh, Because Destiny is the one game they're making right now that is like publicly known, that is publicly released. Like the stipulations around that clearly drove the negotiations. Um, So I'm I'm curious to see what comes of this and at what point. I had previously said that I thought... We might get a teaser by the end of the year for a series. Uh, I think probably at best you're going to get a teaser for a comic, maybe an audio series by the end of this year. Yeah. Um, An animated series, like it it all just kind of depends on the timeline for when the deal closes and how how quickly you hire people. And then, oh, like clearly Sony's going to want this to stay in house. Do you work with, does Crunchyroll and uh, Crunchyroll and Funimation, do they help you facilitate a studio to work with? Do you premiere it on that service? That seems something obvious. You want to keep it in house. Um, there's all sorts of logistics to go about. Like you're probably looking at, at best, like maybe a Q2 2024 release for the first wave of like actual visual media. I'd be shocked if it came any sooner. Uh, but that's just that's my that's my guesstimation. Like I, I don't actually know, and we we don't know that anything's actually going to happen. But where there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. Oh yeah. I just think that's I think that's really intriguing. I think they're going to want to line it up with the final shape as much as possible. Yeah. And maybe this extra media is what can kind of help propel this franchise through what will probably be like a down 12 to 18 months while they prepare us for whatever the next story arc is. Right. 
Uh, that just kind of feels like that big old redacted has got me really thinking. Yeah. On game map. So. Oh yeah, I forgot at the at GDC yeah. they released that big thing. Then there was like the big like there was a bunch of like redacteds for upcoming seasons, but then there was like the yeah. big redacted. At well, the end. John, and John and I kind of we talked about this last week and how that redacted it wasn't like spread out like before you had like oh here's Beyond Light and then towards the end of Beyond Light you had the Witch Queen Starduck. Um. This was like right with the final shape. Like maybe you could say it was like two, three months in. Mm -hmm. And I speculate like I felt that, oh, maybe that's when we finally dropped the two. Maybe we call it de we just call it destiny. We call it destiny one destiny classic going forward. Yeah. Um, you know, like, what do you do? I, I and I, I don't know, like it's clear they don't want to make a destiny three. that They just wanted to call it destiny from the beginning. They never wanted a two, three, four, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. so curious to see what comes out of that um but obviously that is that's a ways off we might hear about whatever that redacted project is next year yeah um i would suspect that lightfall needs to be out before we hear about whatever that might be yeah this feels like a so, this almost feels like a mid-year kind of announcement where it, like it might be something akin to the 30th anniversary, like something that just celebrates the franchise as a whole while we wait for whatever Destiny 3 would have been. Right. Um, but John and I had a really good talk on it. So if if y'all are curious about our thoughts on GDC, on the interview that came out of it with Axios about the content vaulting and the maybe cloud future, I really encourage you to go listen to last week's episode. The cloud future is really, really interesting. Oof, God, I, again, like, he, he and I were like, we, we gotta stop, we could do an entire episode just talking about the cloud. <laughs> uh, but, we, we, we gotta kick the, we, not, cannot kick the show off, we're like 20 minutes in. Um, we're only 17, Josh. Only 17, okay, so, a little bit ahead of the schedule. <laughs> we're, we're gonna jump to a rather short twab this week, and then, uh, Corey and I are talking, we're gonna talk a lot of seasonal weapons. Uh, we haven't had a chance to really cover seasonal weapons, um. Uh, when we both broke for vacation, we were maybe like four weeks into the season. Um, I have had just the worst time in the world trying to get red borders of these fucking guns. <laughs> um, it has not gotten any better, by the way. I buy my guaranteed one each week and I might get lucky and get a second red border to drop somewhere. But my RNG has been absolutely abysmal um, for both this and uh, the Wellspring weapons. So... And we're going to close out with, uh, we're going to do an extra long work order tonight because we've been skipping it lately. Uh, yeah. So let's, uh, let, let's switch to it, Corey. Let's jump into this twab. Let's do it. Uh, the twab. The twab. First, I have to ask you, are you a uh, team mech or team monsters guy? Man, I think I'm, I, I think I'm team mech. You, and that's the right answer. You yeah. get to be a Gundam, Corey. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, I mean, look, this is this is just like the 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 dinosaur the sea monster thing last year, right? It's like who in their right mind would pick the sea monsters when you could be a dinosaur? Like, why would you pick a monster when you could be a? Mech? I mean, okay, so I'm I'm gonna break I'm gonna I'm gonna break this down. You know, lo looking at that image, um, I don't I don't have it in front of me, but I really actually do like the monsters. Uh, aside from the Titan, the Titan one just somehow got worse than last year. Um, I like the Warlock set. I really like the Hunter Cloak, though. I really want the Godzilla Cloak. <laughs> and this is where I... Bungie, I'm begging you, please make the one that wins an in-game quest and let me buy the movie monsters. Hold on. No, whoa, whoa, dude. I didn't see the image. Yeah! Dude, the mechs look awesome. Yeah! Dude, you get to be a Gundam! Dude, the I told I told John that... Because mechs is gonna win. I, I told yeah. him, I says, when mechs win... I will 100% buy both the Hunter and the Titan sets. I might even buy the Warlock one. Like, I'm prepared to drop $45 on armor for a video game. Oh, my gosh, dude. The Titan actually looks cool. The Titan, it, it looks awesome. It looks exact. That is straight up Mobile Suit Gundam. Oh, I love my it. God. I'm so excited. I actually get a I cool helmet. It. I'm prepared to play a Titan now. I actually get a cool helmet, everybody. Yeah, sorry guys, I can I can never run an exotic as a Titan. I have to look like a Gundam the entire time. You could run Doom Archers with those. No, I'm good. 
<laughs> I'm good. Uh, it's funny. Yeah, cause... so if you're signing up for emails from Bungie, go to your email, vote Team Monsters, Team Mech. Let us know who you voted for. I'm curious to see what the split is because I've seen, like, most people being like, oh, yeah, I'm Team Mech. And then uh, there's been uh, there's been some pretty notable holdouts who are like, no, we're rallying for Team Monsters. Team Monsters is getting its justice. I do um, want to say it's all based around that hunter cloak. I do want to say that the hunter monster set looks cool. It looks cool. Uh, it's a better version of last year's dinosaur armor. Yeah. If we're being honest, um, it's a less blase version. I really like the glowing claws. That makes me very excited. Yeah. Um, but I will never get these. Uh, the, I think it was Paul Tassie joked that uh, by 2030, uh, we're going to be on like monsters versus something for like the ninth Halloween in a row and monsters are still losing. And it had like uh, all the uh, Age of Triumph, uh, Kurta's End ornaments like photoshopped all over it. Yeah. All these hive runes coming <laughs> off and like st they still can't win. Um, I, I think now at this point that just has to be like a destiny community tradition that monsters lose. Yeah. No matter how cool they look. Yeah. Um, but seriously, Bungie, I'll pay you for that cloak. I really want that cloak. Yeah. That's... Oh my gosh. I can't believe how cool the Titan set looks though. Oh my gosh. It looks I'm amazing. I'm very excited. I'm very excited for this Titan set. So, uh, this week in the game, uh, Gambit lives, is, uh, Gambit labs is live. It's invasion swap. It's fucking awful. Um, yeah, that sounds terrible. Go have fun. Yeah, no. go have fun. Uh, it is double infamy, at least. So while you're throwing your controller, you're at least getting it double the rewards. It doesn't matter if it's double infamy. I just don't want to do it. I hate Gambit. Dude, Gambit has gotten worse somehow. <laughs> Gambit gets... Con ga Gambit, is, and I mean, uh, I, I think this is going to have to be a topic for us um, when we hit another slow week. Um, but I feel like we've done nothing but gripe and complain about Gambit, but I mean, something seriously has to be done at this point. Yeah. Um, it, it John and I touched on it briefly last week, but it, it needs to be retired for a while. Like take it out of the game for two, three seasons, really revamp it, bring it back with a yeah. content release. Yeah. Uh, you, you gotta do, you gotta do something. It's absolutely awful. I saw calls on Reddit saying bring back menagerie in place of gambit and i don't think that's the answer either no, you, that's not the answer either. You, you guys think menagerie is way better than it ever was <laughs> i'm sorry menagerie was fine the first dozen runs and y'all are remembering when we had the loot glitches and we had like quadruple rewards weekend and things like that that is what you guys are remembering you are not remembering how menagerie was originally intended to be with the one reward per run you are not remembering this correctly i promise you yeah i promise you you are not remembering this correctly and then you would get to the point where like people would stop doing the objective especially in the room where like you were fighting the hive and all the uh, like all the green circles would pop up and like yep. people would not yep. do the objective and it's like what are you doing there, there were certain ones that the, that the community would pretty much just like let fail automatically um master menagerie was not a fun time i remember we had to do that to get the uh the swords and to get the izanagi's burden catalyst right uh, it was just all around terrible uh but yeah so uh have fun with that argument uh grandmaster nightfalls are live <laughs> these are uh awful we all thought it was a glitch <laughs> at first and then nope it's not a glitch acute burns is actually on there yeah uh which whoo the 50% more damage and you have 25% less resistance. Um, yeah, you guys have fun with Grandmasters. I shan't be partaking anymore. Um, this goes back to the whole difficulty conversation that we've had the last few weeks over uh, things like Vox Obscura on Master, uh, the Legendary Campaign, like what is appropriate for difficulty, what is not. Um, and, you know, stop throwing random burns and champions at me. I feel like match game is already like I don't want to say, like, enough of a difficulty, but I think that that combined with, like, mobs, I think you're fine. Like, throw some more yellow and orange bars at me. Stop giving me fucking champions. Yeah. Uh, it's it's not fun. Uh, things like acute burns are not fun. You're already locked down. Just, yeah, I'm good. People were putting on, like, triple resist, and we're still getting one-shotted by scorn crossbows. So, yeah. uh, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I, I shan't be partaking. If you are, 
May the odds be ever in your favor, my friends. Uh, mm-hmm. I might hang out in the arms dealer nightfall if it comes up for double rewards. Mm-hmm. I might. Even then, I don't know how badly I won an adept duty bound. Yeah, do you, I mean, yeah, let's... <laughs> it's a great gun, but I don't know how badly I... I got a god roll on my first try with Zen Moment 1 for all. I don't know how badly I won another one uh, as an adept version. Uh, Iron Banner is back next week. Turn in all your tokens. They're going to go away at the end of the season. Yep. Um, people like me who have like 3,500 tokens are going to be sitting there for a while turning these in. Mainly just to get rep with Banshee. Uh, so that's a lot. Uh, what else do we got? They are doing uh, Kilts for Kids again. Pretty dope emblem. Uh, $50 for this emblem. So um, you got that. There really is, like, nothing in the Schwab this week. I know. Um, R slash place was uh, the April Fool's thing on Reddit, of course. Um, The Destiny community uh, carved out its own little area. Uh, And instead of it just being a big tricorn, uh, there's a little Telesto. There's a ghost. uh, You got the Witch Queen symbol. You've got the Tower with the Traveler. uh, Rulk and the Pyramids. And then right in the middle is the Ace of Spades. Um, there's a combined effort between the destiny communities. Uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, the rules for it were a little wonky. You got, you could only place one pixel, then you get timed out for five minutes. So a not insignificant amount of people contributed to this. Yeah. Um, and then had to redo it because, uh, there was a streamer who sent his community to go trash the destiny one thinking it was about destiny, the streamer and not destiny, the game. <laughs> Of course. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, you, had, you had damage rallying people at like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning to come fix it. Um, wow. Some people. <laughs> and know. as a result, there is a free emblem. The Crushed Gamma emblem. Uh, That's a cool I, emblem. I, it's a cool emblem. Uh, what do we always say about emblems? I've got enough cool ones. Like the ones that I'm wearing are ones that I want to like. I got them from something I want to like brag about. Yeah. Um, but this is a cool one. Uh, the, the code is in the Schwab. Go get it. Uh, why would you not, uh, why would you not want something free basically? Right. Um, yeah, this week is just a whole bunch of updates, honestly. Um, Unbroken Seal, of course, just as a reminder, is getting retired in season 19. This is the last season that you can start working towards the seal because you have to go legend three seasons in a row. Um, the uh, Vow to Disciple emblem that went out during the contest mode extension is going out uh, in the next couple of weeks. Whew. And that's that's all that we've got. I mean, yeah. there's, really, there's really not much else. No. Uh, mean... there's some, there is some cool artwork this week, I will say that. Um, I especially like the uh, Elemental Titans set that uh farian did uh it's the bonus one down at the bottom um it's all for uh elemental affinities of titans with only exotics equipped and it's really 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 cool Uh, he's working on his hunter series right now Hmm. um so i'm curious to see how all those turn out um i like those a lot you should definitely check them out Oh, here's they did put the uh, they did put the artwork at the bottom for what the uh, Halloween armor looks like. So did they? Uh, freelance trials will be this weekend. There's really not a oh, lot yes, else. It is. Man, there is like nothing else. Um, but there there is one thing I want to note really quick. We'll, we'll obviously talk about it more next week uh, with next week's Schwab. But uh, next Thursday. Uh, in the TWAB, we're going to get some news about an upcoming rotator of sorts in Season 17 that has to do with raids. The weekly featured raid is finally coming to Destiny 2. Oh, wow. It only took, like, six years of us asking for it. But it is, in fact, coming. Um, Great. Just, yeah, I mean, hey, maybe people will go play Last Wish and Garden for the first time in years, uh, which would be cool. Uh, if you've never cleared those, that'll probably be an opportunity to go clear those. Uh, we knew they were going to do this with a weekly featured uh, raid and or dungeon. Um, I'd be shocked if the dungeons weren't thrown into the rotation, at least initially. Yeah. Um, or, hey, maybe give me a rotator of dungeon and a rotator raid every week. That'd be better. Um, 
Yeah, we were kind of speculating on what the rewards could be from that. Um, John and I were earlier this afternoon, and uh, obviously my dream is to get a special set of armor ornaments, uh, a la the Age of Triumph. Right. Um, I don't know that that would ever happen, but that would kind of be the dream for me. Um, he was saying that he'd like to see, uh, you know, more uh, spoils drop, like guaranteed spoils drop from each encounter. Um Pinnacle loot, and I want to see exactly what else. He said something else that had that got me really thinking. Um, updated perk pools uh, and craftable weapons. Um, and I want to just like set expectations right now. I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, I'd be really surprised if they had craftable Last Wish weapons come out of this. I understand that Last Wish and Garden have very outdated perk pools on their weapons. I just don't see them going through and updating entire suites of weapons for two raids yeah um that are barely played as it is um i do have a better chance of getting armor ornaments but i don't even think that's a really high chance um maybe you'll just i think it's just going to be like double drops like guaranteed double drops or something yeah or I maybe don't... like guaranteed red borders or something for vow when it comes up i don't know yeah well i mean they could change the armor a little bit, right? Remember, because like remember with Taken King and Wrath, they had two like like the armor was kind of altered depending on which version of the raid you did. I remember. Yeah, and I mean, you did have the yeah, you had that, um, and that's not the same as the Age of Triumph ornaments. Though, no, right? it's not. No, it's yeah. not. But I mean, you could you could do that. Um, like like having something that's like a little flashier or like slightly different would be something, especially considering the reception to the initial garden armor when it came out. Um, that it was basically just a reskin of the trials of Osiris or not trials, uh, curse of Osiris. Um, yeah. Eververse armor. Yeah. Uh, even though it looks way cooler. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's what you do. Like maybe if you complete it, you, uh, when it's the weekly feature raid, like you could be guaranteed the exotic or something. I don't know. There, there's a few different things you could do here. Um, but I definitely think that like getting spoils is probably like the way to go. I don't really know what else you do. I guess we'll find out next week, but yeah, it's either set your expectations super duper low or they're going to be sky high. Like, I know some people are already freaking out, like, oh, my God, oh, my God, it's going to be like Age of Triumph all over again. Like, uh, let's let's temper those expectations just a tiny, teensy bit. Now, if it is, you will you guys will be catching me in Last Wish uh, LFGs and Garden LFGs uh, the weeks that those are up. Because I'll 100% be going to try and finish out my armor sets, but also get the new armor. Yeah. Uh, craftable weapons would be cool. Updated perk pools would be cool. Again, I just don't, I don't know if they'll actually do them. Yeah. So, and of course, you know, Vow, uh, Vogue, and uh, Deepstone are all fine in yeah. terms of perk pools and weapons. But that does it for an abnormally short twad. Like we knew it was going to be short, but man, that was almost nothing. I know we spent more time that. talking about crap than we did this. <laughs> We really did. Yeah. Go, go thank your local sandwich maker. Um, I guess let's just go, let's go ahead and jump into the main topic. We're, we wanted to talk about some of the seasonal weapons here. Uh, we've got six of them. There, there, there are six of these weapons and I wanted to discuss the weapons, what we're feeling about each one, maybe what role we've been using, but also like, I want to talk about the acquisition and the crafting of these weapons because I think it's a little absurd um, so let, I guess let's go ahead and start there. You know, John and I had a pretty extensive crafting discussion last week and about red borders. And I've been beating this drum for a while now that I think that red border weapons need like the drop rate needs to be increased in playlist activities at the very least. Like I get red borders, but they are never for the craftable weapons and it's infuriating. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times I've gotten a red bordered funnel web or that stupid viced SMG that or uh, not SMG, the viced uh, sidearm that I will never ever use. Um, the rocket launchers, uh, the stupid Amalon grenade launcher, like things that I will never conceivably use in this conceivably use in this game, I get as red borders all the time. 
but to actually get the red borders in both the wellspring and in the seasonal suite is just maddening. Like I did no joke, like my 60, 60 or 70th wellspring run last night. It's very, it's a very high number and finally got my last red bordered weapon that I needed uh, yeah. to be able to finish ha- being able to craft any throne world weapon. And it's like the requirements for some of these, like even in the seasonal suite, I think it's the bow and the breech loaded grenade launcher only require, or excuse me, the, the grenade launcher and the uh, LMG, I believe only require three drops. It's complete three red borders. Every other weapon is five. And until I started buying them, I had never seen a red bordered piece of mine. That is still the only way I've ever gotten a red border piece of mind. Um, I'm convinced that red borders for the bow do not, ex- does not exist. The sniper, as far as I'm concerned, does not exist in my loot pool period. I've gotten one sniper to drop the entire time I've been playing the expansion. These weapons do not exist. No matter what you may think, they do not exist. I promise you. Uh, like, I, I, I'm not saying like, oh, we need to go crazy with this. But when I look at the drop rates I got of these weapons uh, or of weapons in past seasonal activities, and I would say that the weapons dropping are on par with that, you need to turn up that red border percentage drop by like maybe 25, 30%. Like, I, and I, obviously I'm trying to armchair game develop here, but like, I wonder if there's a way that we could get you to like crank it up the more that we spend in like, the psyops playlist or like for bounty completions or something like that. I don't know. Like if we decode uh, weapons there, I, obviously your first weapon of the week is always going to be a red border. I'm having to spend so much umbral energy to do that, to get the guaranteed weapon drop. Why not just make all of them red borders permanently? If I'm dropping nine of them, I'm sacrificing decoding nine umbral Ingrams in favor of being able to get my weapons. I feel like that's a pretty fair trade-off, personally. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't. I don't see anything wrong with that, yeah. um, especially like. And I, I get the idea of well, you know, this is going to be around all year. I'm mainly thinking for down the line, though. Like, I'm not worried. Like, I I will have these weapons craftable by the time Lightfall comes out. That's not my concern. Like, I'll probably have them by the end of the season, frankly. Now that that's what I'm like quadrupling down on, but. I'm thinking, what does this look like when we get the final season before Lightfall and you've got three months to pound out these weapons, you know, before their acquisition method goes away? Yeah. Are you still going to make me grind out five blueprints for this before I get it when it's purely based on luck? Like, I have had better luck getting some of the red borders in the fucking raid than I have with the seasonal stuff. I've done the raid a whole hell of a lot less than I've done the seasonal things. I had every almost every seasonal triumph done before I saw any red borders in the wild for the seasonal weapons. And that's with like having my perks turned on and everything at the war table. Like I'm about to reset my rep at the war table, and I have never seen a red border sniper, bow. I think it's just the sniper and the bow. I've I've finished Sweet Sorrow, I finished the breech loaded grenade launcher, and I'm about halfway on both the machine gun and the pulse. It's just, it's wild. Like, turn up. Like, I I saw a content creator or two, I think it was at the end of week two, beginning of week three, being like, oh my god, I finally got my last red-bordered weapon. And I'm like, motherfucker, I haven't seen a single one of these. (laughs) Like, I have such great static rolls that I may not go grind out said rolls. But you just know there's going to be some roll that doesn't drop in the wild that is going to be like god tier and you want to have it. And this is a genuinely great suite of weapons. Uh, I think that's what I'm getting at is like this is one of the stronger seasonal offerings I think that we've maybe ever seen. Yeah, I agree with you. I I think it's like this and Splicer are probably my top. And I think I've got Season of Dawn uh, with the Saint-14 and Osiris suite like right below that. Yeah. Um, It feels like every... Every weapon in this suite has a purpose. I, I and I don't think it's a bad sniper at all. Like the sniper's probably like the lowest on my list. Yeah. Just because I think there's a better kinetic snipers out there. But this one being a stasis one definitely helps. Yeah. 
Like, I definitely like that. I just don't know that it's going to unseat, like, Succession or Eye of Soul in my primary slot if I'm right. taking a sniper. Or, you know, really is an obvious if we're being totally frank. Um, but I guess let's just, let's let's go ahead let's go ahead let's get into the weapon the weapons themselves before we go on and before I go on any more soliloquies. Um, let, let's get into it at the end. Let's uh, let's kind of like do do a power ranking of where we where we see these weapons. So we're gonna start off in this in this primary slot. Uh, we're gonna start off with uh, you know surprise surprise we're we're gonna hit thoughtless the sniper rifle up. Uh, Corey, have you have you used the sniper? Yeah, I I've used it a little bit, uh, mostly because yeah. <laughs> it was my highest kind of powered sniper, and I had bounties sure. to do, and you know I I wanted to test it out because it was a stasis one, and uh, it's yeah, all right. Stasis sniper in the game. Yeah, it's it, fine. It's okay. I mean, it's it's fine. Uh, it wouldn't be my first choice as a sniper, but it's no, it's. No. It's interesting enough to use, I guess. Uh, but it's it's okay. I, I I really don't have much to say. It's it's okay. Do you do you have a role that you've you know you enjoyed using on this? I mean, the one the role I got was perpetual motion and snapshot sights. Okay. So okay. that I mean, I haven't really been grinding for a role for this weapon because I don't really no. use snipers a lot. And this is this is lowest on my priority right yeah. now for the for the new weapons. Yeah. That was that was the role I got, and I was happy with it. And I'm like, okay, I I don't really need this sniper rifle <laughs> anyway. So, I, uh, I I kind of echo the same feeling. Uh, I played with it a little bit in a couple of lost sectors, and was like, okay, um, I could see where you know maybe you enjoy this in PvP. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And maybe somebody will enjoy it there. I'm sure people have used it in trials or in like uh, survival. Yeah. Um, the role that I was using when I was playing around with it, so I've got a range master work on it, um, but it's got headstone and steady hands. Headstone, Ooh. I'm not a big fan of on a sniper because, I mean, come on. Yeah. Um, there's way better perks you could have in that first column, I feel, for a sniper. Uh, but I do really li I like steady hands. I just, it's fine on a sniper. Yeah. I guess um, if you're just like a sniping god, I would say it's probably good there. Yeah. Um, it's definitely a PvP perk. Um, especially if you're going to have it on a sniper. Um, so it's it's fine. I've got a pendant mag and I've got fluted barrel on. Um, yeah. Just overall, like, I feel like there's a lot better options for a kinetic sniper. That doesn't mean that it's bad. I want to be like super clear about that. That does not mean that it's bad, but it does mean that, you know, thankfully, because this is Destiny, we have a lot of choice. Yeah. Uh, this is this is definitely the lowest on my list for weapons. Um, not saying that it's bad, but um, unless you really, really, really are desperate to get a good stasis sniper rifle, like right out of the gate, I would probably say you can leave this one for a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, now, if you happen to get a good roll... A good world drop, cool. Uh, I don't know what the crafting looks like on this because, like I said, I am at zero out of five on red borders for this. This gun simply does not drop for me. Both rolls I have of this gun hilariously are exactly the same roll. I just I looked in my vault. <laughs> They're exactly the same roll. If it tells you anything about how few drops I've gotten of this gun, yeah. So, uh, but let's let's shift gears to a gun that I really really want to talk about. And that honestly probably would have been close to number one on John and I's list last week if I had let him talk about seasonal weapons. And that's Peace of Mind, the uh, pulse rifle for this season. Hmm. So Pulse of Mind is a 540 pulse. Um, if that sounds familiar to you, uh, it, is, it is a pretty rapid fire uh, pulse rifle. It is... I want to make sure that I'm not talking out of turn here um i believe that is almost on par with god is it on par with blast furnace sorry i i'm like kind of thinking out loud here now because now i'm starting to doubt myself as i'm about to say it um i'm trying to find my don't doubt yourself josh don't do it don't do it <laughs> 
we'll see. Now I ha- now I have to look in dim for it. Um, here we go. Blast furnace. Uh, nope. Blast furnace is a 450. God, I get 540s and 450s confused. It's very easy to do that. Uh, so this is a little bit more of a rapid fire than that. Um, and you definitely get when you start firing, it's like blah 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 blah. It's very quick. Mm-hmm. Um. The role that I've been running with on this, and I think it's a, a lot of it is due to this role, I think, of why I'm really loving it. Uh-huh. Um, I have uh, Overflow and Vorpal on this. That's the role I have, too. Um, Overflow, for those of you who haven't gotten to enjoy it, um, picking up special or heavy ammo automatically uh, loads this weapon beyond normal capacity. I was running around in uh, the Wellspring earlier with like 95 rounds in the mag. Yeah. Uh, this it, it's it's nutty. Uh, I really 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 enjoy this, especially on harder content. Uh, in the raid on uh, raid in Nightfalls, I've just been running this because I'm constantly picking up special and heavy ammo in those. Yeah. Uh, in lost sectors, man, it is. And I, I agree with what uh, I want to read a little bit of what the wish list note in Dim says about this gun. Uh, it's likely the best 540 we've had so far. It's craftable with stellar perks. You'll be you're sure to be able to find something here you'll love. But the consistency is king. And it's important to note the fine tuning will feel different on console versus PC. For example, invest more into recoil on console, whereas PC can offset this by investing further into stability. Um, this is the one that I'm currently trying to get enough mats to be able to craft. I've had such good luck with my static rolls that I haven't really taken the time to be like, ah, yes, I need to chase the red borders. I I think I'm one red border away from being able to craft this one. So I'm, I'm fully prepared next week to be able to run straight to the pyramid after I buy my first, my first red border of the week. Uh, and spend it on this pulse. I'm ready to go and craft one and just upgrade and fine tune that thing. Nice. Uh, that is that is going to be my baby. Uh, I've had a lot of luck with this in PvP though. Um, we were playing momentum control. I was running this in there. I was running it. Uh, I ran it a little bit in mayhem of all places earlier. Uh, Last Iron Banner. This this is a weapon that I think is really great for both PvP and PVE. Like in a way that a lot of pulses like normally aren't. Yeah, I think it's like this kind of goes into the blast, the blast furnace and like messenger pulse rifle hall of fame for me. Uh-huh. Like both of those, I think were really good in both activities. Yeah, like regardless of buffs and nerfs. And this one, I think that this is definitely a little bit more wild to use in PvP for sure. Like you have to make sure you're hitting your shots. Um, and I might prefer Insidious in PvP, but. Man, what a great expansion. For, we got three Stellar Pulse Rifles out yeah. of this expansion. Yeah. Uh, and all three of them are craftable. They're all great. I love it. Uh, actually, we really, we got four because we got an awesome 450 Solar one that we talked about last week as well. The Amalon one. So it's a great time to be a Pulse Rifle lover. I yes, have never had a better time with weapons in Destiny than I am right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been using uh, Overflow and Vorpal as well. Uh, when I'm not using uh, uh, Outbreak, this is the Pulse Rifle yeah. that I switch to. Uh, the other one that I've been enjoying is, um, and I want to make sure that I'm talking. Yeah, so uh, I've also been using uh, Moving Target and Overflow. Uh, I've been enjoying that one a little bit more in PvP. Um, just for, you know, like the name suggests. Uh, but definitely like Overflow, um, Moving Target, um Vorpal, and then uh, of course the ricochet rounds you can get on it, and um, yeah, certain barrels. This is just—it's a kick-ass gun. I can't wait to see what the crafting screen looks like for this because I'm gonna play with this one for you know months, if not years, to come. This is gonna be a default in my uh, in my arsenal. So it's kind of funny we went from like the worst, what I think is like the most underwhelming weapon, to what is like a hundred percent like my S tier weapon to come out of this expansion, yeah, or out of this season. Yeah. Um, any more thoughts on peace of mind before we move on? No, I. Yeah, I mean, not anything you haven't already said. It's a great it's weapon. Gr- it's great against champions. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, for getting those stuns, man. Yeah. Outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. Uh, the second weapon I want to bring up 
is probably my other favorite weapon. It's my it's my only other S tier that I have, and it's Sweet Sorrow. Yes, this uh, the is the one rifle. I use all the time. <laughs> this I, I have described it um, on this show and two friends as our uh, Chroma Rush with arc damage. Yeah, this thing sounds like a fucking machine gun. It's awesome. Going off. It's awesome. Um. Uh, I don't know that there's a bad roll on this gun. If there is, I certainly haven't uh, seen it. So, the again, as I see wish list notes, I want to kind of read some of them out here. Um, so, it's almost certainly a better chroma rush for majors while still having good utility and general content. It allows you to expand loadouts and flex into kinetic or stasis special weapons while still having that good bullet hose in your back pocket. Um and I do agree here, like, you need to clean up the recoil. Um, that is definitely rough here. Um, triple tap, Vorpal together can shred majors or champions. But, uh, yeah, it's it's good. Um, and the you, you definitely want to aim for, like, a reload masterwork on this. Like, yeah. this thing just, it's a monster. My reload is uh, weighted as a, at a 70, and that's without having any other mod on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do think it could do stand to do a little bit more damage, but Jesus, in like a nine out of ten encounters, this thing is still going to be great for you. Yeah, um, this would this was one hundred percent one of my day one weapons in Valid Disciple. Uh, this is something that I've been taking into Legend and Master Nightfalls, Master Psyops. I have been running this weapon a lot. Uh, the specific role that I've been using that I have masterworked is uh, Focused Fury, Perpetual Motion. Um, and I, I've been running that, um, if it gives you any idea, I have 1600 kills with this thing. I really, really, really love this gun. Uh, but I've used so many different versions of it by now. Like I couldn't even begin to tell you like what, what my best ones are. Uh, I got another one, uh, another, uh, focus fury, perpetual motion, um, over here, I'm just looking through my vault real fast. Uh, one for all triple tap has been really fun for me as well. Um, I've been a big one for all proponent, especially with something like this where you can just spray and pray. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one for all works really well on like this and on pulses, SMGs, sidearms. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just, God, I, I have yet to see a truly bad roll of this weapon. I don't know if it exists. Yeah. Uh, what, what have you been rocking on this? Uh, I've been running Perpetual Motion and Vorpal. Okay. Um, that's kind I, of... Uh, the... Hilariously, I haven't gotten a Vorpal roll yet. Um, I have a feeling I'm going to need to go craft it. Yeah. Uh, which, if I do, I, that's probably the exact roll that I'll craft is Perpetual Motion uh, Vorpal. Yeah. As, at least as soon as I'm able to. Yeah. Um, especially with the enhanced... Heck, even if I just made an enhanced version of... Uh, the one that I'm currently using, uh, I would do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really yeah, enjoying it's... it. It's awesome. I, As you know, Josh, I'm a big auto rifle guy. Big auto rifle guy. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've heard that. And, uh, man, this gun. Just, it's great. This gun fucks. Yeah, it's like, great. Just, if I can invoke the great Russ Hanneman, this gun <laughs> fucks. It's fantastic. Uh... <laughs> Chroma Rush was the last time I really fell in love with an auto rifle, and that was nine months, nine ten months ago. Mm -hmm. um, God, I've been using Chroma Rush since last May. It's starting to sink in. Um, <laughs> it, it's been a while since I really fell in love with an auto rifle. I like Duty Bound. I had it on my list last week, but man, this trumps it in like every conceivable way. It's a 720. It's a straight up bullet hose um, compared to. At 1.600s were king. Um, in a different world, Duty Bound would definitely be, like, my top-of-the-line pick. But uh, I definitely think here, a Sweet Sorrow, like, you you, you can't go much better. The, uh, one thing I really like about the expansion is we've gotten so many good elemental weapons that have come out of this. I think both between, uh, between Void and Arc. It almost feels like Solar got left behind in a lot of ways. With one notable exception, which we'll get into in here just in, in just a second, but I think that the 
Uh, I think Ark and Void really, really, obviously Void, but I think Ark definitely shines in this expansion as well. If you look at things like uh, Sweet Sorrow, you look at Insidious, um, I mean, God, even those two weapons, it's probably enough to say, like, yeah, uh, Ark weapons are back on the menu, even if the overall expansion and the season have really kind of doubled down on uh, Stasis and Void weapons. That gives me a lot of hope for the upcoming seasons, that hopefully we'll see uh, we'll see some love for Solar and a little bit more for Arc. Um, but if they, if they're already looking this good, I'm really curious to see how everything is going to keep looking when we get to Solar and Arc 3.0. Uh, this is almost certainly going to be a must-have auto rifle when we hit Arc 3.0, though, with how yeah. your weapons and your subclasses <clears throat> interact. If we get something akin to um, volatile rounds with arc oh my then gosh it, it's it's over this yeah. is going to be the top tier gun um i've been running it i got one of these to drop i think day one and i'm pretty sure it was this exact role and i have not taken that out of my inventory since which role was it? what role are you talking about sorry I'm uh i am still talking about sweet sorrow um my focus fury perpetual motion yeah. uh, i've been using that I'll, okay that's that's the one i've been using pretty much since day one yeah um but I want to sh- I want to shift gears just a little bit to uh, we're going to talk about two types of weapons that I don't really like to use, but I'm definitely coming around on one of them, and that's the breech loaded grenade launcher here, explosive personality. Um, as far as breech loaders go, this is an outstanding one. I-, I think Bungie's really been nailing it with the breech loaders over the last year and a half or so. Uh, you had deafening whisper, oh, which was the uh, the Void one with the Blinding Nades and Ambitious Assassin back during Season of the Hunt. You had Ignition Code uh, with the Danger Zone perk back in uh, Season of the Splicer. And now we're continuing to add to that with Explosive Personality, which is the Solar Wave Frame uh, breech-loaded grenade launcher. Um... It, of course, since it's a seasonal weapon, we, we should, probably should have noted this. It comes with a land tank. All these weapons come with land tank. Right. And I re- this is why I really like it on Sweet Sorrow and on Peace of Mind. Uh, final blows grant increased resilience and additional damage resistance from combatants. Man, when you're mowing down rank and file enemies or breaking shields like you are with Sweet Sorrow, like you just can't get much better than this. Right. Um, but I, I wanted to note that while we're here, because... Um, one of the, so uh, on the wish list notes here, we have, um, unrelenting pairs naturally here along with fast reloader perks like threat detector, feeding frenzy and frenzy. There's currently an odd glitch. Uh, and this is as of a month into the witch queen where the gun specifically does more self damage. So it can't be fully utilized shooting at your feet in the same way other wave frames can. Um, I don't know if that's still a thing that's happening. Uh, but just so, kind of something to keep in mind. I... I wouldn't say like I've been using this a ton, but I have been using it more than I do the average breach. I don't like breech-loaded grenade launchers. I don't like them. Mountaintop yeah. was a rare exception, and Wither Horde is just really fun to troll with. Yeah. But this and Dead Messenger have really been working on changing my mind on breech loaders. Um, specifically on this one, I have been running uh, Frenzy with Feeding Frenzy hard launch and high velocity rounds um, all of which are recommended perks through dim uh, got a handling masterwork on this this thing's a monster it's an absolute monster so you've got you've got frenzy which is being in combat for an extended time increases damage handling and reload until you're out of combat and then feeding frenzy is each rapid kill with this weapon progressively increases reload speed for a short time these two pair together like bread and butter and it is just absolutely nutty especially if you've got a grenade launcher reloader on just you can basically just keep squeeze non-stop squeeze this trigger just yeah you know you don't have to really aim just shoot huh. shoot you'll hit something hmm. Interesting. it's great uh, i i really like this i've got a few roles i've been playing with here uh been playing around with that um and uh another one i've had is uh auto loading uh with disruption break um, I think Disruption Break works good in certain situations, specifically uh, for champions. 
I really like it. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily ideal here. Like it's this is definitely good for shield breaking. I, I should say that. And the part of the deal with or the entire deal with disruption break is when you break the shield, they are more vulnerable to kinetic damage for a while. Uh, it's great for team shooting. Somebody breaks the shield, everybody else just piles on. Uh, great, you know, break the boss's shield and just, just dump ammo in. Um, so I like it. Uh, this is a fun gun, but I do blow myself up more often than I really want to admit out loud. <laughs> and that's that's not a joke. I legitimately blow myself up an awful lot with breech loaders, so I have a bit of like a phobia of using them. <laughs> uh, Corey, have you been uh, you've been using explosive personality at all? I I haven't because I don't like breech loaded. That's uh, totally fair. Grenade launchers. Totally fair. I do have. I I I gotta look up what role I have. I know I have golden tricorn, which I had. I golden tricorn is a god tier perk now. Is it? Yeah. Okay. As as we approach solar 3.0, uh, that is going to be an absolutely nutty. Okay. I perk. so I gotta look up this role. I got I'll have to try it out on some things because I I don't really know. <laughs> what the other perk I have is because I literally was like, oh, I'll just throw it in my vault. I don't, I'll pull it out when I need to do a gunsmith bounty or something. <laughs> mm hmm. So, uh, that, and that's fair. Um, that's typically when I was using mine as well. Um, but I am genuinely enjoying this in Dead Messenger an awful lot this oh, season. I'll have this to is probably like out. third in my power rankings right now. Okay. I probably have this third. Uh, I think this this and the, the one we're about to get to are pretty interchangeable for third and fourth. Just like I think Sweet Star on Peace of Mind could be interchanged for that one and two slot. Hmm. Um, the next one we have is the is the bow, the Void Bow, Under Your Skin. Uh, this is this is a fascinating gun or fascinating weapon as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm not a big bow user, but this has absolutely been one that i've kept my eye on um it's probably the one i've used other than the sniper it's probably the one i've used the least but with void 3.0 it is very 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 good in uh higher end content mm -hmm. um i have had uh i have two roles that i've played around with one is opening shot perpetual motion okay so uh so the perks i've been using on successful are on a successful warm-up on under your skin um i've been using two different ones here <clears throat> the first i've been using is successful warm-up and tunnel vision uh successful warm-up and th these are two perks i think that it's a match made in heaven uh each final blow increases charge and draw speed and then tunnel vision of course is uh reloading after defeating a target increases target acquisition and aim down speed uh aim down sight speed so those two together on a bow that obviously you have to reload after every single arrow is just kismet. Right. That is that is absolutely what you want uh, if you're looking to break shields rapidly, if you're looking to uh, to stun champs. This is the one that you want. Uh, bring up, bring on anti barrier, bring anti barrier bow, overload bow, bring them all on. This will be my go to in those. Uh, the other one I've been using uh, is Opening Shot Perpetual Motion. Uh, not as much of a fan of this. I really love Opening Shot on bows, uh, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But uh, not a huge fan of Perpetual Motion. Usually when I'm using a bow, it's because I am hunkered down. Uh, I'm not moving around nearly as much. Um, unless I'm in the Crucible, but I don't like taking bows to Crucible. Right. As far as I'm concerned, both of these would be absolute monsters in momentum control. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Corey, have you been using this bow at all? I've been using it a little bit. Okay. Uh, I've been, I have archery's tempo and dragonfly on mine. Uh, dragonfly on a, on a bow. That's, uh, that's spicy. Yeah, it is. It's cool too. <laughs> Especially if you hit that precision shot and all that, you see yeah, the void yeah. explosions go everywhere. It's awesome. Yeah, that with the volatile rounds must be awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Especially when you get, get into like... Uh, a big kind of, uh, you know, the where I use it the most actually is the the light blade strike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it and you get like you get into that uh, kind of that first room where you have all the enemies and then two of the uh, the the hive guardians in there, and you just kind of take out <laughs> the hive that are running at you. It's mm -hmm. it's cool, dude. It's really cool. It's it's a great bow. Uh, again, you know, not a huge bow fan, but I think this is a really good bow. 
Um, and it's definitely one like the, um, what do you call it? Tunnel vision and uh, successful warm up. That one is definitely going to be kept in my pocket. Uh, successful warm up is just moi. That yeah. is for for both this and uh, for fusions in the crucible. You cannot do much better. Yeah. Um, but I think that leads us to our final weapon, and this is I don't think polarizing is the right word. But I don't know that it's not at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it has mainly to do with where this type of weapon is at right now. But recurrent impact, the uh, the LMG that you can get in the expansion or in the season, um, <laughs> this thing is it's fine. Um, I think as far as LMGs go, this one is at least fun. Yeah. Uh, it is stasis, um, and I, I've got two different roles on this. The first one, I'm pretty sure that this was the uh, standard role that they give you the first time that you get it when you complete the seasonal challenge, but headstone, perpetual emotion, um, with tactical mag and small bore. Um, and then the other one I've played around with a little bit, um, and this one I'm definitely, I feel like I'm more jazzed about, um, although headstone on an LMG is nutty. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, I was definitely using it uh, on the European Pyramid campaign level, uh, clearing out the space underneath the pyramid at least. Don't worry, I did in fact take it off for boss damage. Um, But on this, uh, I have tapped the trigger and subsistence uh, along with extended extended mag. So it got a little, it gets a little crazy. um, But LMGs are just such a mixed bag right now. I have. I, I don't they're not in a good place they haven't been in a good place for quite some time and I don't know if that's going to change anytime soon yeah uh, but if it ever does I have this and the LMG from uh good old vault of glass as well as uh set my seventh seraph saw my uh Adept Swarm, like, I've got, I've got plenty of weapons. I'm ready for LMGs to be good again. Yeah. I just, they, I don't know where they fit into the meta right now. Like, we have auto rifles that are legitimately better than LMGs right now. Yeah. I mean, there's one like, this season that's better than most. So, we literally just talked about Sweet Sorrow. Sweet <laughs> Sorrow literally fires like an LMG. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you can get overflow on that gun off the top of my head, but if you can, Jesus Christ. I bet I you can. Ever been a we- I don't know if there's ever a weapon I've wanted overflow on more than that. I bet you can get overflow. Oh, on I that. bet you can. I bet you can. Yeah. It's just so. What do What do you think about this gun? It's It's definitely it's... perplexing. It's one of our first stasis heavies that we can actually use. Yeah, it's fine. Like I use it in yeah. psyops sometimes because I have uh, subsistence and one for all. Ooh, one for all on an LMG. Uh huh. I like that. Yeah, and so uh, it's. It's okay. It's fun. Like it's fun. You know, I'm not going to take it into any end game activities or anything, but it's fun. Yeah, it's it's fine. Yeah. It that's like the best thing I could say about it is it or like the best and the worst thing is it's fine. It's not going to set the world on fire even when LMGs are good. I don't know that this is going to be like a meta option. Uh-huh. Um it is still good. Like the perk pool is good on this. I love the idea of having a headstone on an LMG. Yeah. Um, that's gotta be crazy. It's, it's interesting to say the least. I I would definitely say it's interesting. Um, so if we were, if we were to rank these weapons, these six weapons, uh, I was kind of doing it as I went for me personally, I'd have to say it's like, I would split them kind of into tiers, like first, second, and third. So like you got kind of your, like your your A tier, uh, and then like your lower A upper B tier. Uh And I think you just have like, you have C tier and D tier. Yeah. Um, so up in that that top, top tier, uh, I've got both Sweet Sorrow and Peace of Mind. Yeah. Uh, and they're pretty interchangeable as the one and two. It's like a 1A, 1B situation yeah. for me. Yeah, those are definitely my top. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, in my my lower A, upper B tier, I've got Under Your Skin and Explosive Personality. 
Yeah. I think there's just such good perk combinations, and those weapons have so much utility. And, like, the utility of explosive personality, I don't know that we can even, like, fully evaluate until we have Solar 3.0 in our hands. Yeah. But I think that thing's going to be an absolute... If Dead Messenger is anything to go by, this thing's going to be an absolute monster when we get those Solar reworks. Yeah. Um, I think in the C tier, I've got... Uh, I've got this... Uh, I've got the LMG. I... I've already even forgotten the name of it while we're sending it. Recurrent Impact. Impact. Recurrent Impact. Um, yeah, Fart Knocker 69. Um, <laughs> I got this thing as a C tier, and then, I mean, like, I'd probably put it like a C minus, and mostly it's just because, like, I haven't gotten a good role to play with. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that uh, that John is probably rolling it, rolling it over dead right now hearing me say this, but uh, at the bottom of the list, I got the sniper. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I've got... Um, I've got uh, I've got thoughtless down there, and that's that's about what it is. I don't think about this weapon. I try not to. I don't want to. Um, You're thoughtless have, about thoughtless. I'm thoughtless about thoughtless. <laughs> I have better I have better options. Um, just like flat out, I have better options across the board, and that I would say is a pretty frustrating place to be. Um, it's a weapon that I really want to get a good roll on, but I just haven't yeah and i don't know that i will anytime soon um so again it's not it's not that it's bad it's just i have better options at this point right so uh that's that's where i think i'm at with these i I don't know if you have any uh, any differing thoughts no well i mean i i had explosive personality low because i don't like grenade launchers but you're no, changing that's fine. my mind i mean dude if you if you've got it low that's fine i mean but you're changing my mind with you know things you're saying you know you got me you've piqued my interest <laughs> you know but uh thoughtless is definitely last for me i just i don't care about sniper rifles at all like i literally only that's use fair. sniper rifles if i have to use it you know yeah so I uh, I, def- I definitely understand that. Um, so folks, there you have it. We've got uh, we've got Sweet Sorrow and Peace of Mind up there uh, as our top weapons of the season. Explosive Personality and Under Your Skin are not too far behind. And then down towards the bottom, we've got Recurrent Impact and Thoughtless. Uh, which, hey, my opinion on Thoughtless is probably going to change. Um, I feel like the LMG has to be down. I feel like Recurrent Impact almost has to be at the bottom just by virtue of being an LMG. Um, cause they're not good at all, but Hey, I would love to, you know, be able to come back in a few weeks and be like, Hey guys, I was able to craft the thoughtless. Finally, I was able to get some red borders. They do in fact exist. Uh, and this is the role I've been rocking and I've really been liking it. Um, but I, I largely agree with you about snipers. I don't, I'm not a big sniper guy. I keep Warple snipers, uh, on hand just in case and, uh, lead from gold snipers just in case for, uh, for boss encounters. But I think the only time I've even used a sniper in PvE in recent memory was uh, the day one raid. I took my uh, Adept uh, Uzum in there. Um, and, I, yeah, Warpole led from gold, of course. Um, that's really the only time I think I've used a sniper. That, and I do I do really like Father Sins. Uh, I do have to say that. I did say that was one of my top weapons. Uh of the expansion i like guess the best of the throne world weapons hands down um yeah. judging by the amount of them that i have sitting in my vault um but again like i i still think there's better options out there um when it comes to primary snipers that's that's the other thing i hold against it i just think that there are some outstanding kinetic options um namely i mean is a nagis and i know it's not technically a sniper but uh Arbalist is pretty hard to beat in that slot if you need something with a lot of range. Yeah. Uh, Arbalist and uh, Succession, I would take almost any day over this one. So, um, heck, even uh, Silicone Nermona is uh, is up as a Nightfall weapon. Like, I, I take that. I have opening shot firmly planted on mine. I'd take that over Thoughtless right now. Yeah. So, not not that it's a bad gun, just, like, kind of underwhelming considering, like, how good... It, and I, it's probably good that we have a weapon that's at least initially at first glance is underwhelming to me yeah. um, because God, you've got four top tier weapons. Like 
all weapons that may be like best in the slot. Yeah. I mean, don't forget, uh, don't forget about the exotics either. You know, I mean, like the some of the exotics from this season are pretty decent. Yeah. The so the only the two technical uh, exotics that we have from this season are Grand Overture, which is the season pass one. We we can talk about these real quick. Um, Grand Overture, um, which again LMG, mm-hmm. uh, but it's really fun because it fires the Cabal mini missiles. Yeah, that's just that's what makes it fun. <laughs> um, it's fun in non-serious content. I yeah. haven't taken it into anything above like a regular playlist strike. Oh yeah, no, I wouldn't take it into anything serious. It's just fun to do in like yeah. a Lost Sector or like a like a regular strike or whatever. It's a fun goof off weapon, I would say, um, which I really enjoy. Um, you, you need those, and I like it when Destiny does some funky exotics from time to time. Uh, just that's why I like Parasite too. Uh, but Dead Messenger, man. This is one of the best exotics they've put out in recent memory. Uh, it, the the hard light of grenade launchers, and especially I love that they introduced it this season, knowing that the changes to Arc and Solar are both coming this season, yeah, or this year, because this is a weapon that is awesome with Void 3.0, and it's only going to get better. Yeah, uh, it, you know it's the trip the triple wave frame. There's truly this is this is a truly exotic weapon. Yeah. Uh this this is awesome. I really like it, but um man, they they got to do something about changing those elements out. It takes it just takes too long on these guns. Yeah. No, they they got to do that. It would almost it would almost be beneficial if you just like <laughs> went into your menu and switched it out. It would almost be faster. Almost. Like <laughs> it would be pretty close. So, uh, so especially uh, if you're like especially like if you're trying to get to a specific element and you have to go through the thing twice, you know, like, mm-hmm. oh. it's, it's great. I really, really, really enjoy dead messenger. I think that the catalyst definitely elevates the gun uh, mm-hmm. a bit. I need to hurry up and unlock the catalyst myself. Um, because I have it unlocked. I just need to like, you know, do the things to earn it. Right. It's, I don't know. It's it, it's good for me. Like I like I like Osteostriga, I like Parasite. I like Grand Overture. I love Dead Messenger. Yeah, Dead Messenger is I I think to me it's probably the clear cut um, best exotic in uh, the. It's between this and Osteo. I think for the best uh, exotic that came out with the expansion. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think there's anything else that really like compares. The parasite is fun, but like, can I really say that I think it's better than either of those other two guns? And the answer is no. Right. At least as far as I'm concerned. No, I 100 um, percent agree with you. And it's not the exotic glaives, so that's already <laughs> points in my book. Uh, just how god awful those things are. So uh, I actually kind of appreciate that we didn't have like a whole bunch of like crazy exotics this time around, like that completely shook up the game. You have dead messenger and you have osteo. And I guess when I think about things that shake up the game, it's not like, Oh, these are really good PVE choices. Like I'm all for that. I think it's things that I'm worried about breaking PVP. Like I see dead messenger, but it's not like everywhere. I see osteo, but it's not everywhere. Right. Yeah. Um, And that's, that's comforting. Dead messenger is getting used a lot in trials though. If I'm remembering the charts correctly, uh, which does not shock me that and God, you fire that and have somebody have a wither horde on your team and you'll lock things down. Yeah. Uh, so any, any final thoughts on seasonal weapons on either the six legendaries or the two exotics before we jump into lore corner? No, I'm just happy that the uh, weapons I like to use are at our top tier pulse rifles and auto <laughs> rifles, pulse rifles and auto rifles. Um, I'm okay, good. So thank you, are... thank you, Bungie, for giving me some weapons. Thank you for giving us weapons <laughs> that uh, Corey enjoys and the archetypes that he enjoys. Yes. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, let's dive into lore corner. We're we're gonna have uh, two longer pieces. They're both coming out of the book for this season, out of the quintessence quintessence book. Uh, these are a few weeks old, but we haven't had a chance to get to these quite yet. Uh, I needed them to be unlocked in the API first, so I wasn't trying to read them off of the living room television from my office. 
Um, but this first one is, uh, it's number four. Uh, we've done one, two, and I want to say we've done three as well. Uh, I think we did three. I think that was the week that you did it with. I'm trying to think. Uh, I know we did one and two for sure. But was there? I'm trying, I'm trying to remember if we did three. Do you remember me making fun of Shah Han anytime recently? No. No, because I right. always remember that. All right, we're doing three and four then. Uh, if we have read three, my apologies, everybody. We'll do five next it's week. It's fine. Everybody likes to laugh at Shah Han. <laughs> if you don't, you're wrong. I actually really love this piece of lore, though. Uh, I don't know if I can clown on him too much uh, because it kind of encapsulates the New Light experience as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so here we go. No, uh, this is uh, the Quintessence book, number three, Cold Forging. Eyes up, New Lights. Shah Han spoke to the group of guardians assembled at the edge of the Cosmodrome, a field of ancient automobiles spread out behind him. The guardians gathered at uneasy attention, fidgeting in their new armor. Han leapt onto the hood of a rusted-out car so he could be seen over the massive titans standing in the front. You may have heard they're coming for you, Han said, that the hive god of trickery got her claws on the light somehow, and now she's sending the toughest baddies humanity has ever faced to drain the life from your carcass. Han shrugged. You heard right. The Guardians lifted their weapons and eyed the skies warily. They're coming to the Cosmodrome because the stories they're most frightened of have their beginnings here. They want to wipe out a whole generation of Guardians at its source. Han pointed at the Guardians who were still holding their weapons anxiously. They think they can hit you while you're all still green. Before you've got your feet under you, they think you'll go down easy. A haggard crow, calling harshly rose from somewhere within the sea of twisted metal. Han smiled and pulled a small canister from his belt, gave it a sharp twist, and tossed it carelessly into the rose of car behind him. The Guardians leaned forward in anticipation, but nothing happened. And that's where they're wrong, he continued. They have the light, same as you. They're strong, same as you. But you kicked your way out of your coffins right here in the heart of old Russia, like so many of the greats before you, and you found yourself in the vanguard. Han waited for a moment as a taste in the air. And being part of the vanguard, that means something. The most powerful warriors the world has ever known are here for you. Ikora, Zavala, Saladin, Shax, Saint-14, the guardians who have driven the hive back into their holes again and again. They're up in the tower, and they have your back. Show them you're willing to fight for the vanguard, and they'll show you things you wouldn't believe. You'll learn how to weave a shield out of starlight. You'll learn how to wield a blade as hot as the sun and behind him, a sudden explosion sent a geyser of dirt and rust and metal high into the air. The startled guardians huddled together, and you'll learn the importance of trip mine grenades, Han finished as he turned. Through the settling dust, he could make out the crumpled remains of a lucent hive night. One second, he said. He crept towards the remains, shot his hand in the clearing smoke, and withdrew with it a hive ghost squirming in his fist. The ghost's sharp shell dug into Han's palm. Red blow flowed down over its flickering green iris. You're all going to die here, it hissed. Han leapt back onto the hood of the car, still holding the ghost tightly. Ghosts are tough to kill, both ours and theirs, he said. It takes overwhelming firepower or a special kind of weapon. Something outside the laws of cause and effect. Something paracausal. Han fixed his gaze on the assembled guardians and crushed the ghost in his fist. It burst in a flash of bubbling flame. Something like us, Han said. Like you. A roar echoed from the distant forest. The dark flames erupted from the tree line as wizards took to the sky. The ground shook as a clot of bellowing ogres tore across the field, flinging the remains of ruined cars aside as they charged. You! shouted Han over the uh, cacophony. Each and every one of you are weapons, chosen by the light. And sure, so are these hive, and they're every bit as strong as you when you're alone. But being part of the vanguard? Han turned to the hive army. His gun began to glow a brilliant gold. That means you're never alone. And when the Lucian Hive reached Shah Han, eager to feast on new lights, they met the Vanguard instead. Um, I think this actually goes like kind of perfectly hand in hand with the Gallarhorn lore that we focused on so much last season. Right. Um, we have so few actual like recordings in the lore of what it's like to be a new light. But I think we all kind of had that feeling in Destiny 1 when we woke up in Old Russia. And if you've done the New Light quest, you probably feel the same way. This, despite having the goofiest character in the Vanguard, 
uh, being the one who says it. I really like, I just like try to imagine that it's Crow or Zavala saying these lines instead, or even Saladin saying these lines instead, because mm-hmm. I think it's more fitting. Yeah. But I think it's pretty great that we have, like, in lore, like, contextually, that there are still new lights being risen. And it's not just Randy being an idiot. Uh, this is pretty great. I'm actually almost a little surprised they didn't include good old Randy here. Uh, I think that would have personally been hilarious for me to see. But uh, I, I like this. I think there's so few that describe what it's like to actually be a guardian and not be, like, one of the legends or to be the young wolf that it's refreshing in a lot of ways. Right. Uh, so our next one is uh, number four shutdown. Uh, this is only alluded to a few weeks ago. This is uh, it's called shutdown. It deals with uh, what the crow does when we leave to go do the psyops mission on the moon for the first time. Crow pulled his hood up, pulled up his hood and watched as the Guardian ship roared out of the hangar to race after Keitel's flagship on the way to the Scarlet Keep. He kept in the shadows as he made his way to the helm, pushing through the throngs in the bazaar with an easy grace, inconspicuous even in his recognizable garb. His light movements bellied the twist of guilt in his stomach. Saladin requested him to handle recon on the mission, yet here he was, creeping instead through the tower like a common thief. There would be consequences, of course, but he could accept that. We all have to make sacrifices, he thought. He held his breath as he opened the doors to the Sciorium. As they clicked shut behind him, he threw back his head and allowed himself a sigh and a smile. Crow looked up at the Lucian Hive suspended in the holding tanks. Not dead, but certainly not alive. The Scion sat in its chair, twitching faintly, its long fingers moving as though tracing through water. Pulses of blue energy radiated, radiated out from the Scion's skull and into the depths of the machine. I've got some good news, Crow said pleasantly to the Scion as he passed. The Scion has always said nothing. Crow didn't mind. It probably took all its energy to keep the hive preserved well enough to skim through their memories. The war is over, thanks to you, Crow continued. They sent the Guardian, and when the Guardian sets out to do something, it gets done. The skin on his neck prickled in an old memory. Believe me. Crow approached as display interface covered in cabal runes. He paged through menus until he saw the familiar vanguard symbol nestled in a corner. He pressed it on the language on the screen changed. He shook his head in wonder. Imagine what we'll be able to make in the future when we're not busy squeezing secrets from the hive. Crow frowned, looking up at the holding tanks. After all this ugliness is behind us, he said, and resumed scrolling through the menus. Now, how do we shut this thing down? He found his answer in a hidden directory of commands. Security, override, shutdown, immediate. He paused for a moment, imagining what Saladin's reaction would be, but he of all people should understand. After all, Crow said quietly to himself, the right path isn't always easy to find. Crow executed the command. <clears throat> he walked toward the Scion as the lights on the machine began to turn red in sequence. Let's get you out of here, friend, he said as the Scion began to stir. It blinked slowly and opened its eye. Crow smiled and waved. Good morning, he said. Would you like to go get some ramen? The pulsing current running through the tubes in the back of the Scion's head slowed, and Crow winced as a white-hot pinpoint of pain stabbed into his mind, shrieking a single word clear and impossibly loud. Stop! The machine sputtered. Sparks erupted from the central hub. Cracks spiderwebbed across the holding tanks. Electricity arced from the control panel, and Crow staggered backwards. Without warning, the energy current in the tube suddenly reversed. Waves of blue quickly flowed back towards the Scion. He was pulling at the cables connecting him to the chair when the first blast of feedback hit him. His body spasmed with pain. Wave after wave of psionic energy pounded into the base of the Scion's skull. His muscles stood out in sharp relief as he pulled against the cables, his hands desperate claws, his face stretched with terror. The pulses zoomed faster and faster, and the Scion began to scream. A high, thin noise. He beaded his own head with one spinely hand and reached the other out towards Crow. Crow reached back as another wave of energy hit the Scion, bursting his retina, turning his eye into a muddy black spear. Crow recoiled in horror, his mind pierced by unimaginable pain, and he fell to the floor in a heap. The machine groaned, hissing smoke, the holding tanks boiling, the hive bodies inside dancing grotesquely in the rotting fluid. The blaring sirens began to overpower the hoarse, sustained screaming. Something snapped inside the machine, and it stuttered to a stop. And finally silence so i think this is super important 
to read when you see what happens with Crow, because we assume, oh, Crow just sabotaged it. Crow knew exactly what he was doing. Right. Crow just wanted the guy to go hang out with him. He just wanted to go get a bowl of ramen with the guy thinking, hey, I'm doing him a favor by shutting this machine down. And hey, we can all talk about it when Saladin and the Guardian get back. Right. Instead, he ends up killing Keitel's most trusted lieutenant, somebody she's been friends with for years and years and years. Um, basically the leader of the Scions under her. Right. Uh, it's not a surprise to see that she reacted the way that she did. Right. That she was basically prepared to demand Crow's... Well, she did demand Crow's life. Mm -hmm. And instead, Saladin took his place. And... I think this is a really important moment for Crow as a character. This particular page, it's not just do your actions have consequences, which he already knew, but it's just because you think you're doing something noble, it's not as clear-cut as pressing a button sometimes. Right. Like... If he would, it was a hidden menu that he went into, for God's sake. Like, surely there was a safer way to shut this thing down. Kaido would never build a machine and hook her most trusted lieutenant up to it without a failsafe, essentially. Right. But he he kills him. And that's a valuable ally lost. Like, that's somebody Saladin had connected his mind to. He had seen his memories. They, they had been in the machine together. That's what really changed saladin's mind about so much of this and i think it's important for crow as a character like obviously i i think at this point it's safe to assume that a lot of the seasonal storytelling is going to have crow as a central part of it going forward um all four seasons last year had him this season has him at the forefront it's probably not a stretch to imagine that the rest of these will have him at least heavily involved in the lore of the season right um so i think this this year is going to be a journey of discovery. We already know there's changes coming to Iron Banner. And in the aftermath of this, you know, Saladin leaves the axe for Crow. The axe and his uh, Iron Banner medallion. He leaves them in the helm. You see him leaning up there against the uh, war table. You have to wonder, is Crow maybe going to be the announcer for Iron Banner going forward? Saladin's the vendor, but Crow is one of the announcers? Like, We've talked so much about Ephrodite coming back. Right. I think it's got to be Crow at this point. I mean... This almost solidifies it for me. Yeah, I mean, that would make sense at this point, right? I mean, if Saladin's leaving him his stuff, like, that would make sense, at least for a while, right? I would also, like, secretly love for Crow to become the leader of the next generation of Iron Lords, like, at the end of the story. Yeah, that would be... I mean... I was going to say, well, aren't the all the Iron Lords really, like, Titans? But I guess that's not true. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That'd be inter that would be an interesting turn of events from what we were originally talking about, right? I mean, because we thought he was going to take over as the Hunter Vanguard at some point last year. At this point last year. I mean, I definitely like, think it's, I think it's still possible, but I think it's less possible now looking ahead. Yeah. Um, you think the hunters are ever going to get a vanguard at this point? No, I think the vanguard is going to be just completely destroyed by the end of this expansion. Yeah. Um, it would not shock me if uh, we lose Ikora before the end of the year, or in like the opening stages of Lightfall. It would not shock me to lose Ikora, um, and Zavala be the only one left of the of the core three. Huh. Um, but who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah, who who honestly knows what's going to happen there? Um, I don't know if you can really get rid of Ikora either, because that's where you go get all your new aspects and fragments from. Right. Um, they've kind of wrecked her into doing that, but I, I do think you know there, there's a crushing death coming, and, and I feel like Crow is one of the ones who is like definitively safe at this point in this latest story arc. I think kind mm -hmm. of shows that because oh. Well, we already gave him we gave him a pass already. Saladin took his place in terms of punishment. Yeah, I still think it's Saladin. I I still think Saladin at some point, but this this latest storyline with him yeah. has definitely I would say bought him a few seasons. Yeah. The the real tell will be the Iron Banner title that we get next season. Yeah. And, like, is Saladin going to continue being the vendor? Because, I mean, there is still time left in the season. Something still technically could happen. Yeah. Um, or it could kick off next season or something like that. Like, who knows? But uh, 
one thing is for certain, like this, the alliance between the Cabal and the Vanguard is already shaky as it is. And that's why like Keitel was going to kill Crow and Zavala was prepared to throw the, and Saladin notes this, Zavala would have thrown the entire alliance away to protect Crow. Yeah. Which I think says something about how drastically his opinion of him has changed in the last year. Right. Uh, during Chosen, when he found out it was Uldren, you know, he was shocked. Mm -hmm. He was absolutely shocked. And instead, we, instead of being repulsed, we got the exact opposite of Crow and Cade, or of Ultron and Cade. Right. During Cade's execution. Right. We got Zavala picking him up in what's probably the most powerful scene that we've seen in Destiny. Right. It's got to be, it's got to be like a top three or four in terms of like how powerful that is, I think, to the story into the community, the parallels that it draws. And the right. fact that we got that in a seasonal activity. Right. This is why we need a theater so we can keep watching these. Right. Um, but then you, you watch the journey that Crow has gone on and how, you know, he was secretly helping the Elixni uh, that were in the Elixni quarter. Right. And then how he was assigned to Keitel's flagship in light of the Sabathun reveal uh, when she revealed who he was. He was put directly under Saladin. Mm -hmm. And Saladin, know, you know, he notes that he doesn't know how he feels about looking at him, knowing that this guy in a past life murdered Cade. Right. So what does that mean going forward? Well, I think that that means that with Crow, he's just, I don't know, he, he, he's that important to the story. Like, he's really taken on that role they originally intended for him to have it way back in Destiny 1. And Sure, it took us seven years, seven, eight years to get there, but I think they finally have looped back around to who he was intended to be. Right. Uh, maybe not as like carefree and happy go lucky as he was supposed to, but I think I think things like this, like the the nuance and the details of like, oh, I just wanted to meet my friend. I just wanted to go get a cup of ramen with him. Like yeah. he's so much more like Cade than we're ready to admit. Yeah. Um I think that's one of the that's been one of the true joys, and that's going to be continuing to be the joy of seeing this character grow. I'm really excited to see where they take his character next season in light of this season's developments. Yeah, I wonder if like I see. I wonder how people who jumped in <laughs> with like Shadowkeep or Beyond Light who didn't get to know Cade, like you know what I mean. Like I wonder. I wonder how people who didn't grow with Cade during Destiny One and into Destiny Two. How their feelings of Crow differ from someone like us, you know? Well, and so that's that's actually been like kind of a hot button topic lately. Um, with the campaigns being sunsetted and now, especially with the Forsaken campaign being gone, it's like, who, like, why should we care about this? Like, Cade, Cade doesn't exist to us. He exists in a couple of strikes, and that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um. And I think that's why you have to come up with, like, that's why I think the cloud-based solution from last week that we speculated about really, really intrigued me. Because if you had the option to, like, oh, you know, you're going to be forced to play the Red War campaign and then you can go do any campaign you want to. Right. Um, I think that would be really cool. Um, you could even build Forsaken as, uh, you know, see the fall of Aldrin and the death of Cade, um, you know, or see, you know, see Crow's origins or whatever. Right. Um, I think there's a proper way to build that. And, like, just take the scene from Black Armory and tack it on as, like, a post-credits or something. Right. Yeah. There. Um, of him being resurrected. Right. There, I think there's a number of things you can do, and that's, like, that's an interesting point. Like, Crow is one of the central six or seven characters now to the storyline. Right. You're, and he's only going to get more and more important. Like the Sov twins are going to be more and more important. Yeah. Um, how do you not? How do you not do that? I mean, we see Mara, Mara still grappling with it. Yeah. You know, we know that from the lore. Um, with, you know, her brother being alive, with the fact that he's a guardian now. I mean, we saw that last season. Yeah. I mean, even if you don't look at the lore, we saw it last season. Mm hmm. So. So, and it's, it's interesting to see how, like, her interactions with both Crow and with us have really changed her opinion of the Guardians over the years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we first meet her, she's she's not as hostile as her brother, but she's definitely not welcoming to us. She mainly uses us as a means to an end. And then it's like her experience in the Taken King really changes her. 
Mm-hmm. And when she comes back in Forsaken, uh, when she meets us in the Dreaming City, uh, when we go to the Queen's, the Queen's Court, it's kind of different. Like, she's preparing for a coming war, and then, of course, you know, her returning, and how just the difference since the last time we majorly interacted with her, which really was House of Wolves, if you think about it, outside of a few cut scenes and, well, a few dialogue scenes in the, in her court. Right. Um, that's really the last time, like she hasn't been on screen that much for a character as important as she is. And, right. you know, now with her grappling with, you know, like, well, we're probably her strongest ally. She is aside from us. Like, it's like us, her, and like the remaining disciples are the most powerful beings in the galaxy. Right. So like, she is clearly the only she is the only person that is like on par with us um i mean we have slayed hive gods for god's sake like sure ikora may be able to throw out like two three supers at a time same with osiris mm-hmm. but uh, we have killed how many gods now how right. many of them have we turned into weapons mm-hmm. um three. at least three three at least maybe four yeah um so i i think i'll i'll take the money on the uh, an alliance with uh the sov siblings yeah <laughs> but uh i think that's i think it's gonna do it for lore corner tonight i think that's gonna that's gonna do it for us an extra long one as a return to form yeah it's good yeah. to be back josh it's good to be back i good just to doing be corner. back uh anything else we need to hit on josh or are we gonna skedaddle i, I think here? we're good to boogie on out of here great great uh I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening to this episode of Tower Casuals. If you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, leave us a five-star rating. Really appreciate that. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to as well. Josh, I appreciate your time tonight. Where can we find you? As always, Twitter, at Josh underscore Finn, two N's. I'm uh, going to be fanboy about uh, about Moon Knight. (laughs) Every time I get on there, it's like Josh has said something about Moon Knight. I'm like... uh, Gotta, Listen, gotta th- this is up. this is Marvel Christmas for me, so <laughs> I'm loving it. Uh, you can find me at I am Corey and HD on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can follow Tower Casuals at Tower Casuals. You can email the show your questions at towercasuals at gmail.com. I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening. And until next time, we love you. Goodbye. Bye bye now. Bye. Mm.